Uh, just, just pray before we start. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can come together, Lord, and come and hear your word. Lord, help us to hear that the message that you want to give to us. Help me, Lord, to give a message that's from you and not from me, Lord, and take me out of the equation and fill me with your spirit, Lord, so I can be your messenger today, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, Mark 10.46. Leave that open, please. Thanks. 46. Uh, Carol, we'll just read Mark 10. Uh, 46 to 52, just in case you want to know the scripture. It should say, Blind Bartimaeus receives his sight. <coughs> <coughs> it says... <coughs> Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of uh, Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet but he shouted all the more son of David have mercy on me Jesus stopped and said call him so they called to the blind man cheer up on your feet he's calling you throwing his cloak aside he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus what do you want me to do for you Jesus asked him the blind man said, Rabbi, which means teacher, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Um, I just want you to think just for a moment of your life being like on a road. Now I do a lot of roads, a lot of travelling on my, on the, in the car and uh, I know Sam's up and down to London sometimes and, but I do a lot of travelling in the, in the car and there's some roads that are really nice and smooth and some roads have got holes in them, potholes and there's some that you would never dream that you've got to go down it could be thin, it could be full of gravel and mud and sometimes when I go over to the football over at Heighton there's uh, tractors and all that have been down the roads and there's thick mud everywhere and I want you to think of your life as a bit like a road I really felt the Lord telling me this morning that imagine our road, our life and behind us we've left the road behind us <coughs> and on that road it won't, when you look back it won't be all smooth and there'll be bits of that road in your lives that have been damaged. There'll be potholes that need filling in. There'll be lots of gravel and muck, stench, maybe horse manure or whatever it is, is in the past. But it can still affect our future. And this man, Bartimaeus, that we're talking about today, the story, is a bit like me. It was a bit like me. I used to be begging every day for stuff. So, I want to start off by saying this man, Bartimaeus, the first point I want to make is he seized the moment. He seized the moment. I think to myself, a bit like in Acts chapter 3, I wonder how many times Bartimaeus had sat on that same place on that same bit of road how many days, how many weeks since he was born how many days had he been sat there calling out asking people for help <coughs> today for Bartimaeus was different, it was a different day remember last week we talked about in Luke 4 verse 18 
and Isaiah 61 and the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us and the Isaiah 61 remember I was saying was a prophecy several hundred years before was it last week or the week before I can't remember but and I said that the, the, re the day in Luke 418 was another day it was a day that that prophecy was fulfilled this day that Bartimaeus is on this road is a different day and he seizes the moment he starts crying out son of David have mercy on me he knew something about that day and he acted some of you lads and lasses in this room have, have acted you've seized the moment and you haven't waited around and you've acted you've gone on a car, alpha car so you've someone's mentioned Jesus to you so you've took him on board or your family has or you might still be wondering whether it's real whether it's true or not but you need to seize the moment like Bartimaeus does in this story in this, this story that Jesus is, is directing us into why do so many people stand on the sidelines I go I was at the football match the other night watching the Buddha and Barry was there oh there he is Barry was there uh, who else was anyone else there at the Buddha match and there was 13,000 there but the last four, five, six minutes something like that mm -hmm. you think there was 30,000 people in there all cheering the Buddha it was dramatic ending but I wonder to myself a lot of the time why do people in churches stand on the sidelines and don't get involved with spreading the gospel telling people about Jesus realising that the healing there's such a thing as healing and we can get involved and I've always come up with the same thing for you the frightened have cost people always go on at me about footballers oh Caleb doesn't know whether he likes football or not he sometimes does and sometimes doesn't depends who's speaking to him but he thinks footballers are all um, if he's hearing things said he thinks being a footballer you, 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 you're, not, you're not hard or you, 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 you little girly footballer you know but I think he does that because of his brother because he plays football and it's just a way of getting at him but there is a lot of fear of getting involved and there's a cost let's just say football dedication you've got to be dedicated if you want to be a footballer not many people make it it's dedication a lot of time a lot of effort mainly by the parents they give a lot as well a lot of time and effort but you know some people are happy just to go to church on a Sunday morning and we mentioned this about the man at the at the gate called Beautiful in Act 3 the takers are not givers because to give is a cost there needs to be some work given in going and giving and so people are quite happy and this is my own theory and it's up to you what you think <coughs> But why do people sit on the sidelines? I think it's because they have fear. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. And they're just quite happy to go and sit in church on a Sunday morning and get their blessing and go home. <coughs> that and Mace is sat in the same place every day. We need to seize the moment. We need to continue to seize the moment the second point is we will come across negative people we need to ignore them we need to ignore these negative people on the road people will try to put doubt in your mind I want to read verse 48 to you it says many rebuked him and told him to be quiet but he shouted all the more son of David have mercy upon me so if people will try and put you off your friends, your colleagues, the people in your, where you live the people where you work 
the people you socially knock about with will try and put you off they'll try and stop you the negative about the abundance of life that you're experiencing school friends I know it's out of flash but school friends will try and put you off they'll try and be negative about it's not real, it's not true what you're doing wasting your time but many of them warned them to be quiet but you ignored them my biggest advice to anyone is to ignore people who try and put you off following Jesus I was in uh, Weatherby back yesterday most of the day at 1 o'clock and um, I was there at 1 o'clock and I, I left at 5 or 7 went straight to the Alpha course and while I was there yesterday there was some some really really troubled children really troubled children and I prayed for God to come with me in that place and then I recognised and realised that the Lord was waiting for me in there because even the prison can't stop Jesus going in even them big thick doors that they've got loads of locks on can't stop Jesus being there he goes where he wants he's called it's omnipresent he's everywhere and I went there and the situations I went into were, was, was sad really sad and people had been put down all alive young children had been put down and never encouraged and never built up and never told that they were loved or and this chaos in our world and I was saying last night about the Holy Spirit coming and brings order <coughs> into this chaotic lifestyle that people have when I went to places last night Jesus came with me and you could see that people were finding a little bit of hope it wasn't me I was telling them about me and I was uh, spreading the good news the gospel of Christ I wasn't telling them everything about me, I was t talking about what Jesus does. I didn't, then when I go into prison I had to speak about the benefit of walking like me ever. <laughs> it's all walking like Jesus. If you take Jesus into your life, the benefits are immense. The, the immense life, the abundance of life that you can have is awesome. But by the myth, this blind man is sat at the side of this road on that road he'll have had many times of trouble but he sees this moment and the first thing that happens to him is people try to be negative listen take no notice of them you need to take no notice of them ignore them be like Bartimaeus was he told them that He wanted to go and see, he shouted even louder. Let me tell you something about these people. A couple of things I wrote down about these people in the crowd. These people that are, te that are telling him not to go and try and get near Jesus and ignore him. No, go and sit down. He doesn't want to listen to you. No such thing as, it's not true. There is meal ticket. These people that he's sat with or have put him there are his meal tickets. He depends on them. They feed him. They probably clothe him. They probably they will they'll take him there. They'll guide him there. They'll probably wash his hair for him, maybe, or clean his clothes or what. But they're his meal tickets. You know what I mean by that? They're everything to him, and they're trying to tell him not to listen. I wanted to think a little bit about some of the people who maybe have tried to stop us walking towards the Lord who give us negative feedback there was his meal ticket and what did he do? he cried even louder when I became a Christian again it's not always about me but when I became a Christian I had all kinds of things said about me. I had temptation.
people wanting to pay for me to go and drink in the nightclub and over the millennium. People tell me that I need to shake my head and what a nutcase for being about poor Graham. You know, he's, he's lost the plot, he's brain damaged from the coma, needs a good alibi. Don't go near him, he's absolute, he's absolute off his head. I had all kinds of things said about me, but you know what, I ignored them. I ignored them and kept going forward towards Jesus. You know what I always say, Mark 16, when the two ladies are going to the tomb, and I'm, I know a lot of you have heard this story, but for those who haven't, and for the tape as well, they're going towards the tomb, the Mark 16, the two Marys, and one of them says, I wonder who's going to remove the stone. This mountain that was in front of them, there's a mountain in front of them, this ton and a half flat stone that's been rolled by six or seven big soldiers, and these two ladies are going, and they wonder who's going to remove the mountain, but they don't stop, a bit like Bartimaeus, they don't stop, let me tell you guys, don't stop, you don't listen to them negative people, and they might be very influential in your life. They could be influential, they could be someone who helps you out. Don't listen. You, you need to keep going towards Jesus. And that's what the two Marys do. And when they get there, supernaturally, it's been removed. These guys, some of them gave him money. The people that he was calling out to day by day by day are giving him money. He's begging. When I was begging on the street, I was begging for money, for my drink and drugs. Never out else. Money wasn't money to me. It wasn't getting my son some clothes or paying a bill or going to the match. Or it wasn't money. It was for two pound fifty is a bottle of white lightning. I got five pound I can get out for ten a bag. It was seven pound fifty I can get sixteen. So money wasn't money, it was a, a a means for me to get my fix. And this guy is dependent on these people who every day he calls out to. Can you help me out with some money? I can't say I won't be able to defend myself if I would. And yet they're telling him to shut up. And he ignores them. Do you get the, what I'm saying? He ignored the very people who he depended on. Think about that. What happened that day? Because he risked it all. He ignored these people who had fed him and clothed him. Like I said, he realised that Jesus was in town. When Jesus is in town, things happen. The situation changes. When I went to Weatherby, and I went into this cell where this lad was, he's been there a long time, and he'll probably never get out, and he's got no hope, he's just an existing shell. When I went to his cell, he sat up. Because hope had arrived to his cell. Not in the form of me, but what I had in my heart. Because I ignore all the negativity I you'll never help him. He's just worthless. Why go and bother with him, Graham? Why are you bothering you might as well go and bang your head on trying to help them kids at Asselfield. Give your head a shake, Graham. You'll never change them. Oh, why are you helping him? He's robbed my health. What are you doing that for? I have it all day long. All every week. Someone says to my face, You wanna throw away the key? Haven't Christians come up and say we we'll give you money for your charity. Throw with the key. I just ignore them. Ignore them. Because I believe my faith in Christ can change the future of them children and them, them, and them young adults. Yeah, thank you for that hallelujah. Because it's true. You've got to believe that Jesus can do anything the faith we have, as I've said the other week, we should have the faith that we could walk around the corner at the splash and walk across the, the swimming pool. Because Peter did it. Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water. 
Oh, but that's just the middle of the night, isn't it? Jesus can do anything. And Bartimaeus knows that Jesus is in town. How does he know? How does he know that Jesus is in town? I'll tell you. Because when you go to the genealogy of Christ, David is in the bloodline of Joseph. Right? He recognised that this person, Jesus, was in the line of David. So this man, Bartimaeus, had faith. So when he hears that Jesus is in town, he starts crying out to him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. He recognised that the Son of God <coughs> was in town. We all know <coughs> what happens in John 6, don't we? What happens in John 6? The feeding of the 20 odd thousand. It says 5,000, but there'll have been 20 odd thousand there. And the little boy has this little pack lunch. <coughs> and yet he believes this little boy that the Son of God can do anything. And he gives him this small pack lunch that his mum's made him to feed these 20,000 people. Bartimaeus knows the same power of God is walking past him. And that's why he sees the moment. He seizes the moment and ignores the crowd and goes forward towards Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And then he has to make a decision. He makes this critical decision, which I did and some of you have, and some of you are doing more and more of as you're growing in Christ. And if you listen to this now on, on the internet, this is what you need to do. He says in verse 50, well I'll read you part of verse 49. It says, so they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing away his cloak aside, he jumped on his feet and came to Jesus. Listen, this is the key. The cloak, his coat, was all this man owned in his life. He had nothing else in his life. It was the only personal thing he owned, he meant business. When he sees the Son of God, and he, sorry, he is the Son of God, walking near him, he means business. He threw it all away. It means nothing to me. Because there's someone here who can do anything for me. There's something more I want out of this life. There's something greater in this life coming past me it's called Jesus when I became a Christian on November the 9th 1996 the quarter three, and I knew the power of God had come into my life this is what I did nothing let me say this nothing meant anything to me other than giving the gospel that night at 10 o'clock, I know the exact time, it was 10 o'clock and I was stood at my bench where I'd lived for three years with no hope as a tramp, begging every day for drink and drugs. Not food, not clothes, not bills for drink and drugs. That's why I was surviving. And I began my ministry. Nothing mattered to me ever other than Christ preached. That's all I lived for. I cast away everything. I didn't have anything at the time, but I give everything to God. And Bartimaeus gives us this great example of how we should follow Christ. He gets up and he throws everything he has, that he owns in this life, to one side. He meant business. Do you mean business today? If you're listening to this now, do you mean business? 
If you mean business, he will become number one. Matthew 6, 33, Jeremiah 29, verse 13. I sound like a, a broken record because I keep saying it over and over again. Seek Jesus with all your heart first. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, It's only when you seek me with all your heart. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of heaven. When you seek God with all your heart, first, not second, not third, or he's nearly first, I just have this little bit that I do my, uh, it's very close to Jesus, you know, my wife or my kids are, they're right near Jesus, no, he'll look after your children, he'll protect them, as long as you're getting what you want right, it's your choice to make him number one in your existence and then next to him is your wife and kids or your children or your mum or your whoever but he is first and it's like a triangle God at the top there's Natasha and there's me the closer I get to God guess what the closer I am to Natasha it's not the other way around if God's there and Jesus is and now there and Tasha's at the top, the closer I get to God, the further away I get to the... See what I'm saying? You've got God at the top, the closer I get to Tasha and my kids, the closer I get to God. And that's how we exist, that's how life is. And back the mace, give everything up and went to follow Christ. You give him what he had. He had very little, I had very little, he gave him what he had. He was prepared to give up everything for Jesus. Turned his back on living in darkness. He's living in darkness. Many people in this room were living in darkness. Many people listening to this message now on the computer have been living in darkness. It's time to step into the light. When Bartimaeus gets healed by Jesus, which we're going to go into now, that healing, it says, what do you want me to get to do for you? This is in verse 51. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to, want to see Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. He wanted to know what he needed. I used to laugh at this because, you know, this guy's been blind all his life. Have you ever seen a blind man walking without a stick or without a dog? Do you think they'll be walking with their arms out like that, trying to find something to touch? Do you think that's the truth? You think that's what they'll be doing? Trying to find the way around. Is that right? Yeah. Trying to find the way around. Jesus asked him what do you want? His disciples must have thought. Oh he's broke his leg, what do you think he wants? He's blind. But he's feeling about how many people in this room and listening to this message now have been trying to walk through life like that. And they still are trying to get through life. Wondering when you're going to hit someone. Wondering when you're going to bump into a problem. Wondering when so and so is going to catch up with you or the police are going to get you or wondering when you're going to get evicted or. Do you know, it's. This is a darkness that Batamus has been walking in. This is a darkness that I walked in for many, many years. And the healing in this, this message. The healing in this um, example that Jesus gives him is the healing of salvation. That healing in that context, in this scripture, when it's translated in this context, is salvation. He gets a lot more than sight of his eyes. He steps into the light. It's salvation. And salvation 
is worth more than anything on this planet. You know, I rang my friend Chris Andrews, I was going to ring him, but I have no doubt in my mind that he wouldn't mind me saying this. And people listening on the tape, a lot of us know him, um, a lot of us have had a lot of influence from, from Chris. But Chris, in a materialistically living life, can have anything really he wants to go and buy anything he wanted to go where he wanted to he told me he's been to restaurants and around the world where he's paid a thousand pound a head for his meal it's not but not been an issue to him but was looking for something was searching for something and it came in to his garage in the most unusual manner in me but I was carrying something. I wasn't carrying a case full of money or a new business deal for him. I was carrying salvation because that's what I was walking about the coma for. Nothing else. Just to help people to find salvation, healing, to get them to have sight. Not here, not in here. The sight here. The sight that we live in faith. And that belief that we don't live in darkness no more. That we can walk in the light of the world. In John 8 verse 12, Jesus <coughs> says, I'm, I'm the light of the world. John 8 verse, uh, John 4, 1 verse 4 says, In him is life, and that life is the life of all men and women. That life is the light to all men. What, 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 in him, who's him? Jesus. In Jesus is life. And that life is the light to all men. That changed my life. That one verse changed my life. That's why I'm here from one verse. I heard it off a terrorist. An ex-terrorist, David Hamilton. And he said he read that scripture. I read it and I looked at it. And I thought, wow, in him is life. In Jesus. I've tried to get it in... Uh, drugs and alcohol and money and cars and girls and fighting and respect and dancing and muscles and I put everything in my life to try and find life and yet it's in Jesus that life is in him and guess what that life brings light brings light and the first thing we do when we walk into the dark room is put the light on and we won't walk like this no more stumbling about wondering whether you're going to bump into something because you're living in darkness hey you can see you don't have to worry no more you wake up in the morning and ask Jesus to go before you and when there's an obstacle coming your way if you listen closely he'll let you know that there's an issue coming up or when you go into that issue he'll help you through it he'll shine his light through it with you your faith has healed you he says your faith has healed you. Your faith brings salvation. It brings salvation. Other people's faith has helped you along the way. But we know man's better. We owe man no nothing. Nobody ever owes me anything. It's the glory of God. It's salvation comes from Jesus. God the Father designed salvation. He provided salvation and he gave salvation on the cross. His name is Jesus. If you want to know how, what the design of salvation is, it's called Jesus. If you want to know how to get salvation, it's called Jesus. You only need one thing, it's called Jesus. And you're healed. And guess what he does? Which he's very gracious for. Know that road behind you that's got potholes in it and lots of gravel and stench and without you even looking <coughs> why you're even why you're not looking is repairing it you're getting healed along the way you know my story about not knowing about my dad not knowing about love not knowing about the father's love and then Caleb was born he healed some of it, he filled it up, put some new cement there got rid of that bit in my and then some else in my past will pop up a bit more of that road that's all damaged that 32 years of rubbish that I lived 
on that rose, yeah, some of it was smooth, some of it might have been good fun, but the majority of it had potholes in, and lots of rubble and stench on it. And without you doing it, without you knowing, Jesus is fighting for you, and he's healing your past, and renewing your past. And your future is bright because you're walking with the light of the world with you. Salvation is amazing. I want to read this in Acts 9 verse 17 to you. This is Paul's conversion. Verse 17. Yeah, I'll just read you verse 17. It says, Then Ananias went to the, to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus will appear to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may, you may see again. And he filled and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul, who was Saul, made Saul on the same look like the choir boys, they always say. And Ananias, the most unlikeliest character, went to him in fear. But guess what? He ignored everybody. He ignored the fear. He ignored what people thought of him. Oh, what are you going to talk to him for, Graham? He's a nonce. What are you going to talk to him for? He's a grass. What are you talking to him for? He's a, he's a load of rubbish. We want to talk to him for? It's women. We want to talk to him for? He robs people. We want to talk to him for? He's, he's just a cheat. What are you going to talk to him for? Graham, he's a copper. What are you going to talk to him for? He's, he's not of our faith. What are you going to talk to him for? Well, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm going to see him. Because I ignore you. <laughs> I'm ignoring you. Because I carry salvation. I don't care what anyone says about anybody. I go... Because I, like this man, Ananias, the most unlikely character who was frightened, went and met the most ruthless, persecuting Christian of Christians ever, called Saul. And he has this message for him. That Jesus who spoke to you on the road has sent me. That's all you need to say. Jesus sent me not rocket science, you don't need no theological big talk and education, you don't need to go to Bible college for three years, <coughs> even though sometimes it's good, you don't need to go there, you go to someone and say, you know Jesus sent me, because you might be able to see again, that's what he says, I I've been sent so you can see again, so, eh, not hard is it? But what was hard is ignoring everybody. Ignoring everybody who was trying to put him off. <coughs> Bartimaeus ignored everybody and then got rid of everything and went to Christ and regained his sight. What sight was it at ease? No. It's only a story about that, about the sight. Probably giving me sight back. Paul was blinded. But it's an illustration of real sight. The real sight of life. The light comes on, and then you know what you've got to do. November the 9th, 1996, a quarter to three, the light came on. I know what I have to do. I have to go and tell people about Christ. That's my job. That's what I do. I'm unashamed of the gospel, Romans 1.16. I'm unashamed of it because it helps to restore people's lives. It's the truth, and the truth, when you know it, John 8 verse 32 will set you free. Let me pray for us. I could sit here and talk all day about the subject, <laughs> but Jesus is amazing. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your gift of salvation. Thank you that you designed it, Father. Lord, as we come to you this morning,
as we come to you Lord with all our problems with all our hassle with all the things that have gone in in our lives Lord they've gone wrong or they've seen good Lord at times I ask Lord that we seize the moment we seize the moment so that we may walk in, in, in the light that we step out of darkness into light and we say Jesus help us help us to continually put the light on we continually come to you and say Lord would you put the light on today for me would you go before me today Lord would you help me today I'm facing an issue today which I don't know whether I can handle myself I'm stuck in a situation and I just don't know how to get out of it and I ask you Lord to put the light on in my life help us to be like that thank you Lord that in the last 17 and a half years I can't think of a day that went by in them 17 and a half years where I haven't said Lord go before me today help me today Lord I need you to put the light on I need to walk with you in your light and by doing that we choose to step out of darkness and into light so Lord help us today help us every day but help us today Lord because today has enough troubles of its own without worrying about tomorrow help us today to walk in the light to have a moral heartbeat for you Lord to want to be more like you and being more like you is helping us to put the light on Thank you for the stories and the scriptures, the parables, and this one about Bartimaeus where we could unravel. I could sit here for another hour or so talking about this scripture because it's absolutely amazing how Bartimaeus threw away everything because he knew you were in town. And when Jesus Christ is in town, awesome things happen. And he's with us now. And he wants to be with you forevermore. So just allow him to be with you. Allow him to live in your heart. Allow him to set you free. Allow him to renew your mind. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, Amen guys. Anyone got?